Book Two, Sections One through to Four of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lucy Burgoyne. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Sections One through to four. Our purpose is to consider what form of political community is best of all for those who are most able to realize their ideal of life. We must therefore examine not only this, but other constitutions, both such as actually exist in well-governed states, and any theoretical forms which are held in esteem that what is good and useful may be brought to light. And let no one suppose that in seeking for something beyond them we are anxious to make a sophistical display at any cost. We only undertake this inquiry because all the constitutions with which we are acquainted are faulty. We will begin with the natural beginning of the subject. Three alternatives are conceivable. The members of a state must either have, one, all things, or, two, nothing in common, or three, some things in common and some not. That they should have nothing in common is clearly impossible, for the Constitution is a community, and must at any rate have a common place. One city will be in one place and the citizens are those who share in that one city. But should a well-ordered state have all things, as far as may be, in common, or some only, and not others? For the citizens might conceivably have wives and children and property in common, as Socrates proposes in the Republic of Plato, which is better our present condition or the proposed new order of society. 2. There are many difficulties in the community of women, and the principle on which Socrates rests the necessity of such an institution evidently is not established by his arguments. Further, as a means to the end which he ascribes to the state, the scheme, taken literally, is impracticable and how we are to interpret it is nowhere precisely stated. I am speaking of the premise from which the argument of Socrates proceeds, that the greater the unity of the state, the better. It is not obvious that a state may at length attain such a degree of unity as to be no longer a state, since the nature of a state is to be a plurality, and in tending to greater unity, from being a state, it becomes a family, and from being a family, an individual, for the family may said to be more than the state, and the individual than the family. So that we ought not to attain this greatest unity, even if we could, for it would be the destruction of the state. Again, a state is not made up only of so many men, but of different kinds of men, for similars do not constitute a state. It is not like a military alliance. The usefulness of the latter depends upon its quantity, even where there is no difference in quality, for mutual protection is the end aimed at. Just as a greater weight of anything is more useful than a less, in like manner, a state differs from a nation, when the nation has not its population organized in villages, but lives an Acadian sort of life. But the elements out of which a unity is to be formed differ in kind. Wherefore the principle of compensation, as I have already remarked in the ethics, is the salvation of states. Even among freemen and equals this is a principle which must be maintained, for they cannot and rule together, 
but must change at the end of a year of some other period of time, or in some order of succession. The result is that, upon this plan, they all govern, just as if shoemakers and carpenters were to exchange their occupations, and the same persons did not always continue shoemakers and carpenters. And since it is better that this should be so in politics as well, it is clear that while there should be continuance of the same persons in power where this is possible, yet where this is not possible by reason of natural equality of the citizens, and at the same time it is just that and should share in the government, whether to govern be a good thing or a bad. An approximation to this is that equals should in turn retire from office and should, apart from official position, be treated alike. Thus the one party rule and the others are ruled in turn, as if they were no longer the same persons. In like manner, when they hold office, there is a variety in the offices held. Hence it is evident that a city is not by nature one in that sense which some persons affirm, and that what is said to be the greatest good of cities is in reality their destruction, but surely the good of things must be that which preserves them. Again, in another point of view, this extreme unification of the state is clearly not good, for a family is more self-sufficing than an individual, and a city than a family, and a city only comes into being when the community is large enough to be self-sufficing. If then self-sufficiency is to be desired, the lesser degree of unity is more desirable than the greater. 3. But even supposing that it were best for the community to have the greatest degree of unity, this unity is by no means proved to follow from the fact of all men saying, mine, and not mine, at the same instant of time, which, according to Socrates, is the sign of perfect unity in a state. For the word all is ambiguous. If the meaning be that every individual says mine and not mine at the same time, then perhaps the result at which Socrates aims may be in some degree accomplished. Each man will call the same person his own son and the same person his wife and so of his property and all of that falls to his lot. This, however, is not the way in which people would speak who had had their wives and children in common. They would say all, but not each. In like manner their property would be described as belonging to them, not severely, but collectively. There is an obvious fallacy in the term all, like some other words, both, odd, even. It is ambiguous, and even in abstract argument, becomes a source of logical puzzles. That all persons call the same thing mine, in the sense in which each does so may be a fine thing, but it is impractical, or if the words are taken in the other sense, such a unity in no way conduces to harmony and there is another objection to the proposal. For that which is common to the greatest numbers has the least care bestowed upon it. Even one thinks chiefly of his own, hardly at all of the common interest, and only when he is himself concerned as an individual. For besides other considerations, everybody is more inclined to neglect the duty which he expects another to fulfil, as in families many attendants are often less useful than a few. Each citizen will have a thousand sons who will not be his sons individually, but anybody will be equally the son of anybody, and will therefore be neglected by all alike. Further, upon the principle Everyone will use the word mine, 
of one who is prospering or the reverse, however small a fraction he may himself be of the whole number. The same boy will be so-and-so's son, the son of each of the thousand, or whatever be the number of the citizens, and even about this he will not be positive for it is impossible to know who chanced to have a child, or whether, if one came into existence, it has survived. But which is better, for each to say mine, in this way, making a man the same relation to two thousand or ten thousand citizens, or to use the word mine in the ordinary and more restricted sense, for usually the same person is called by one man his own son, whom another calls his own brother or cousin or kinsman, blood relation or connection by marriage either of himself or of some relation of his, and yet another his clansman or tribesman, and how much better is it to be the real cousin of somebody than to be a son after Plato's fashion nor is there any way of preventing brothers and children and fathers and mothers from sometimes recognizing one another. For children are born like their parents, and they will necessarily be finding indications of their relationship to one another. Geographers declare such to be the fact. They say that in part of Upper Libya, where the women are common, Nevertheless, the children who are born are assigned to their respective fathers on the ground of their likeness. And some women, like the females of other animals, for example, mares and cows, have a strong tendency to produce offspring resembling their parents, as was the case with the Pharsalian mare called Honest. 4. Other evils against which it is not easy for the authors of such a community to guard, will be assaults and homicides, voluntary as well as involuntary, quarrels and slanders, all which are most unholy acts when committed against fathers and mothers and near relations, but not equally unholy when there is no relationship. Moreover, they are much more likely to occur if the relationship is unknown, and, when they have occurred, the customary expiations of them cannot be made. Again, how strange it is that Socrates, after having made the children common, should hinder lovers from carnal intercourse only, but should permit love and familiarities between father and son or between brother and brother, than which nothing can be more unseemly, since even without them love of this sort is improper. How strange, too, to forbid intercourse for no other reason than the violence of the pleasure, as though the relationship of father and son, or of brothers with one another, made no difference." This community of wives and children seem better suited to the husbandmen than to the guardians, for if they have wives and children in common, they will be bound to one another by weaker ties, as a subject class should be, and they will remain obedient and not rebel. In a word, the result of such a law would be just the opposite of which good laws ought to have and the intention of Socrates in making these regulations about women and children would defeat itself. For friendship we believe to be the greatest good of states, and the preservative of them against revolutions. Neither is there anything which Socrates so greatly lords as the unity of the state, which he and all the world declare to be created by friendship. But the unity which he commends would be like that of lovers in the symposium, who, as Aristophanes says, desire to grow together in the excess of their affection, 
and from being two to become one, in which case one or both would certainly perish. Whereas, in a state having women and children common, love will be watery, and the father will certainly not say, My son, or the son, My father. As a little sweet wine mingled with a great deal of water is impeccable in the mixture. So, in this sort of community, the idea of relationship which is based upon these names will be lost. There is no reason why the so called father should care about the son, or the son about the father, or brothers about one another. Of the two qualities which chiefly inspire regard and affection, that a thing is your own and that it is your only one neither can exist in such a state as this. Again, the transfer of children as soon as they are born from the rank of husbandmen or of artisans to that of guardians, and from the rank of guardians into a lower rank, will be very difficult to arrange. The givers or transferers cannot but know whom they are giving and transferring, and to whom. And the previously mentioned evils, such as assaults, unlawful loves, homicides, will happen more often amongst those who are transferred to the lower classes, or who have a place assigned to them among the guardians for they will no longer call the members of the class they have left brothers, and children, and fathers, and mothers, and will not, therefore, be afraid of committing any crimes by reason of consanguinity. Touching the community of wives and children, let this be our conclusion. End of Book 2, Sections 1 through to 4